Um, I think we should probably disclaim that um, this is uh, going to be straight coming off episode three in season right. eight. So if you're watching this or hearing this and you haven't seen it, like this is the worst decision ever. So yeah. now's um, your time to check out. Welcome back to the Citadel. Dan Strapper, Mike Palmer here with you. We did a live stream Sunday night after the episode, The Long Night, also known uh, as the Battle uh, for Winterfell. Uh, we uh, had a, an hour-long discussion. You're going to hear excerpts from that, but I want to pick up with Mike here a few days later. Mike, uh, first, yeah. how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, I know based on my performance on the live stream that, that folks will be hearing shortly, uh, you know, I, I seemed a little touch and go. Uh, just because we were all a little shook. Like, we were in the moment of reaction. And then what's interesting is, like, since that, like, they're sort of, like, the collective... We know what Twitter thinks now. Right. So, like, at the time, we didn't really know what Twitter thought. So, like, whatever we had to... Or social media just in general. Uh, so, it was interesting to see... To listen back and sort of understand what did we think in the moment... And then now reflecting on it, like what is sort of like the meta analysis of the whole thing? Like, you know, you can almost like get, get all the nuance of it, uh, you know, in, uh, in a way that you really can't in real time. So like, uh, it's kind of interesting. It's almost like the difference between like, you know, doing the sports and then sort of the sports commentary universe that, that just like keeps going, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so, so yeah, that, that's my general impression. I'm doing well. I mean, I've definitely been thinking a lot about the show too. And the other thing is like, I think it takes time to kind of even like fully assimilate what happened, uh, you know, and uh, I'm still, I think I'll still continue to process it. Uh, and then, it, and then we'll be right back into episode four, you know? And we've talked about it before about the binge watching and binge learning and the idea of space repetition. I think uh, it has helped me to not be watching this season all at once. Uh, mm -hmm. that I've been able to sit back and think about this episode a little bit more and, and read about it, you know, Slate and Vox and all the different media outlets have had different varying takes on it along with Twitter and Facebook yeah. and all the different places. So you get different uh, viewpoints. Uh, we're going to talk to Kristen Smith later on. I want to get her take uh, on the, I guess what I would deem bloodlust to an extent, like the lack of deaths for some people uh, mm -hmm. stood out. And for me, it did. And I, I read a, a good Slate article on that, that Game of Thrones almost, set us up for that in the early seasons they set us up that no one is safe that you know death is around the corner what do we say to death you know not today right. um and then this episode didn't necessarily deliver on that high level of people passing the, the the characters that we've fallen in love with and i think that's the one thing that was missing for me and we'll talk to chris about that but did you feel that at all did you feel like there wasn't and i know it's a strange question uh but the lack of major characters dying in this episode was a miss or do you feel like it was just right now a few days later? I think it's all like the, the, the take community. Everybody has to have a take on the sure. show, you know? So like, that was why like in the moment we were all just like, that was pretty cool. And <laughs> like, and then we were also kind of shook because we were surprised by some of the developments. And then visually nothing really looked like that show before. Right. Like there, we all know what that show looks like now. And like those images are in our minds, but like, we, or, or the lack of those images, as the case may be. But, um, but, I, but I think it is interesting just how different the, once everybody has had an opinion, and also I was, I was kind of jokingly changing my take to be more critical, uh, you know, early in the week, just because if you're critical of it, people think you're smarter and more like hip somehow, because you're not like, well, you know, sure the rabble found it uh you know entertaining but uh, but i'm more sophisticated than that and then the other angle is like if you were like oh it was just too dark you know i couldn't see the figure it's like kind of like okay you know like get over yourself so like so i feel pretty comfortable with my positive take on the long night uh so i think i kind of i'm gonna stay sort of i'll be a moderate uh candidate on this one i'll just say it was actually quite a good episode and i think it did sort of change uh, the way people think about sort of the visual language of, uh, of Game of Thrones. And then I think the rest of the show will be more like the part of the show that I really love, which is like the intrigue and complexity among the characters and like intrigue at court and like, like 
less supernatural battles. I know there'll be dragons there, but like I did find that like the magic part of Game of Thrones was never something that I that I really loved. I, I found the the political intrigue to be the thing that that really uh, got me going. Uh, and then also the just the suspense and surprises to the the way the things play forward. And I think with the Night King, that the the thing that people are so disappointed about now is just that uh, he's just dead. Like he's gone. Right. But like but it almost just clears the room. It's kind of like the Ewing effect in basketball, right? Like you get, you get the big fella out of the way. Now you let the rest of the characters uh, thrive, you know? Opening up the lane for, for the Starks and uh, Derek Harpers of the world. I, I can yes. appreciate that analogy. Uh, we're going to take a listen to some of that live stream. So it's an edited down version. Uh, some of the highlights from uh, Mike, Brandon Jones, Frank Jones, Ken Florence, and myself discussing Sunday night. You're going to hear that. Then we're going to come back, talk to Kristen Smith about her takes and exactly what uh, she thought about this episode and her thoughts moving forward. All that on the latest edition of the Citadel. Enjoy the bits of live stream. If you want to watch it in full, head on over to our YouTube channel, search uh, training and education. It's up there. You can watch it the full 50 minutes, but for now, just the highlights right here on the Citadel. I survived uh, the, the battle of Winterfell. So that's saying something, right? So, uh, and this is like fog. We're still like fog of war. I didn't have time to like get all my hot takes off the interwebs. This is all like we're all still kind of digesting uh, what just happens. Yeah, you you uh, gave a gut check. Uh, I guess the Nikon got a gut check. That didn't work out so well. <laughs> um, I think we should probably disclaim that um, this is uh, going to be straight coming off episode three in season right. eight. So if you're watching this or hearing this and you haven't seen it, like. This is the worst decision ever. So yeah. now's your um, time to check out. Definitely check out right now. I'm doing great. I was really stressed out for um, in, in not. I'm speaking as if it were past tense. It's present tense. Like that was very. That was a very <laughs> stressful experience that that continues. But uh, but I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm gonna share the same sentiment. Right, it's just a lot to process. That's literally what I said after it went off. I had just stopped there for a moment and was like, okay. I just got to, from the top to the bottom, it's a lot of thoughts to a lot of emotions, a lot of range of emotions, you know. Initial reaction, good episode, bad episode. You made a very specific point on our last Citadel about there was a high ceiling, low floor for this episode. Did it meet yeah. your expectation? I think pretty close to the ceiling. Uh, it was it was pretty great. Um, you know, there was uh, uh, Deus Ex Aria at the end that uh, that that made it wrap up. Like, if it had ended with everyone dying, all the living dying, um, that would have been worse. Uh, so I, I think a, a really good episode. It was the the beginning of it was really hard. It was actually kind of hard to process because there was yeah. all there was. Mike mentioned the phrase "fog of war." There was there was a quite literal fog of war. It was hard to follow through the snowstorm and the people were getting lost. But I think they did a nice job of um, imperiling all of our characters that we like know and love and and you i i really felt anyway that they all were in danger at sort of all times in the episode i also think they did a nice job of sort of moving uh, resolving what i think is a little bit of an op problem and an overpowered power problem with the dragons because if the dragons had been able to be in the whole fight presumably they would have been able to just continue to burn and burn and burn and burn right so i made a nice job with that and it was um it was pretty dramatic. It was uh, pretty uh, stressful, as I mentioned. Uh, I thought uh, uh, really, really good episode. It, it's got a little popcorn uh, kind of at the end uh, with the Aria move. Like that That felt a little more, uh, it made sense, but it also was, I'm usually, uh, I expected the Night King to last longer, I guess. So like, I, I felt like there was a little, it was a little too tight an ending. And then suddenly the Army of the Dead's just, gone uh which you know was established earlier in uh the story uh and then also honestly i did forget that aria was like scurrying around just because so much stuff was going on and um those and then i also was just waiting for theon to, <laughs> to go the way he went i mean that that was uh, pretty much a, a fait accompli so uh so so i, I felt like plot wise if i'd had time to think about it it probably felt a little pat and not totally obvious but i mean you can't you wouldn't expect 
uh, the showrunners to have John kill the Night King. Like right. that, that would have been totally bad, totally on the nose. Uh, this felt like a pretty fast way to resolve that entire narrative. But, uh, but I think they delivered brilliantly on it. Like the, and also the, the suspense in this one uh, really threw out. So like the, I think the battle scenes were intense, but like for uh, like a hundred and you know, however many minutes, you know, over an hour, you know, over an hour, like an hour and a half, I think over an hour and a half, right? Um, it, uh, it just really kept, uh, the, it, you never knew what was gonna happen and it maintained that really for the entirety of the, the episode absolutely disoriented for the first 22 or so minutes of just like okay i think this person is still alive right because even how they were cutting it people were kind of getting like ambushed and you've seen them like oh and feeling painful and i'm like okay is this being that this person gone are we going to see another cut to this person so that whole element i think was good because it continued to build suspense right you didn't know who was who was surviving from cut scene to cut scene the whole fog and the notion that you couldn't even really see anything the opening scene i thought where they were marching into the darkness was also awesome right like building up again that that we know something's on the other side we have no idea what it looks like or what it's going to be when we meet heads with it and i thought they did a brilliant job of maintaining suspense um in in that anxious feeling throughout the entire episode um and in typical fashion right like they they answered some questions and and opened up a whole can of others right that stretch at the end was really all music ken right like in terms of the sound like it was just the there was there was very little dialogue you know like i think there was whatever uh bran was saying to theon but like that was about the only dialogue in the last yeah like a, a pretty good stretch there and like talk about mood too you know because like it does feel like there was really good mood setting in uh in this episode and I felt like I guess was it cellos or something like there was there was this sort of like brooding uh score uh, at the well, end the there. cellos are the or the game of thrones thrones mainstay you know uh-huh. I think they they took a different turn on this one though they went they went kind of Hans Zimmer with the the ticking, the clock ticking, just insistent ticking. I guess it started around like the middle of the episode and basically went into the last scene. Um, because I mean, they, there's only so much that they can, uh, there's only so long they can sustain that epic music for. Eventually that kind of just like blends into the background. So they have to do something to change it up. But uh, on the sound front though, I thought, um, I kept on thinking something was gonna happen to Grey Worm because they kept on getting Absolutely. heavy breathing mm-hmm. from him, you know? And I, I thought, oh, he's, he's about to go, but he didn't apparently. So. Are we sure about? Yeah, so I, I thought that too. Are, do we know who didn't die? Well, I, we need a confirmed kill list, right? I, I think yes. that's yes. I, I'll be honest. I was taking notes uh, on uh, memo pad, and I kept on saying dead question mark because I wasn't sure is that what's happening. I think Gray Worms alive. Uh, I, I think we saw. Um, so Mike, I know you were keeping some notes as well as as far as who who passed. Alessandra took took herself out of the Definitely. situation. She walked out. Jora has has departed us look like uh, it right i mean we there wasn't an on-screen death he was like mortally wounded and was like pretty close to out but i don't you know it'd be pretty weird if he came back right beyond pretty sure beyond donsky yeah yes night king uh didn't look very good for the night king right <laughs> it as did. far as we could tell uh leanna mormon leanna yes. mormon also looked like uh you know giants bane made it through it too right so like Brandon, I think you had the over under at five and a half. It was pretty close. Yeah, because I was thinking if you did the count and like, because we even talked about this with the Night King count as major. I think we said he would, right? He would. So you got yeah. Melisandre, the Night King, Theon, Beric. I was saying that Dolores Ed was below the line, so I wasn't counting him as major, although I took a lot of flack from that. Yeah. That. Um, Wait, Ghost we- TBD. Lady Mormon, right? I don't know. Lady she, Mormon, I think, is not major. I mean, yeah, nice character. She, great story. A half. You said five and a half. I'm, I'm trying to give you, maybe you like <laughs> hit it on the nose, you know? Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty close. I was surprised. So I was surprised that Grey Worm, if we assume that Grey Worm is alive, and I think that we think he is, I'm yeah. shocked. I'm shocked that Brienne is alive. Yeah. Um, I thought that like we had seen our last of her in episode she two. She had like no screen time. Yeah, she had was, a couple cutaway scenes where in each cutaway scene, it seemed as if that was going to be her last scene. Right, yeah. right. 
when they overwhelmed all of them, like up against the wall or on top yeah. of the, the mound of dead bodies, like everyone was having their little "I'm getting overwhelmed" sequence. Mm-hmm. I was convinced that more of them were gonna were gonna die in that. And and Sam made it through as well, yeah. which I found interesting that his point of view was the very first mm. that we seen, given the fact that throughout the story, he's probably been the weakest character that we've seen on screen as well as we geared up for this massive battle of heroic and epic proportion. It starts off with a character who's been most likely characterized as being the weakest individual. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I also, I, I, I kept thinking Arya might go too. Yeah. I mean, she had a lot of, I mean, there were a lot of times when if she were to go, she could have gone that way. I wouldn't have wanted her. I, you don't want, ever want Arya to go, but like it did feel like there's been no one more skilled, qualified, or trained to actually survive this situation right. more so than Arya, right? Yeah. yeah. And assassinate, like, you know, like she kind of, the Night King is not an easy guy. You got to kind of catch him off guard. And that's like, because if John had come in with, you know, John pulls his sword and. <laughs> Yeah, all right, buddy. I'm just gonna raise the army of the dead, and I got bigger fish to fry. But it's like Arya's the, the you know, she's like sneak attack. You know, so I'm gonna throw this out here really quick. Go ahead, no, please. What, what if the Night King all along? What if this was a suicide mission, and in, in the sense that he knew that this was going to happen? Because I felt as if, you know, he was toying with Bran. If he was really trying to kill him, he could have killed him, right? Like the bond, he yeah, the Bond villain, right? Right, right like, you know. <laughs> So I'm like, maybe this is his end to his suffering. Like maybe he wanted to have all of this happen so he could finally put an end to this suffering because he didn't want to be the Night King to begin with. He was kind of forced into this role. But then also like the the whole Song of Ice and Fire uh, was another thing here where like this was actually, for a moment it reminded me of like, you know, Heat Miser versus uh, Snow oh Mice. Where it was you like- Santa Claus, yeah. You had, you had like the, the ice stuff versus the, the fire stuff. And uh, I thought that was, uh, I, I, I don't think they're gonna come back to that. You can't come back to that any more than they just did, right? So like if this was, the, maybe they can, but like, I don't think there's that much ice left. The, there's mostly, to, there'll be a little bit of fire and some dragons, but, uh, but like, I don't know how much, uh, you know, the, the ice really was the White Walkers and the, the Night King, the Army of the Dead. So um, I do, I agree with your point too. Like, uh, kind of badass way to walk into that scene. Uh, you know, the the Night King. Uh, you know, he he rolls he rolls deep with his uh, with his crew, uh, and he also can roll strong by himself too. So, like I, you know, uh, for a character with absolutely no uh, backstory, no backstory of substance or depth, uh, he really did command the screen when he was on it. Uh, but his crew so, never even got a chance. We never even uh, seen him like do anything. They just kind of just rolled up, and just like slow motion. Like here. It reminded never me a little him, like stab anyone. Like, it reminded me a little bit of uh, Chappelle show when uh, you know Prince uh, is about to play uh, play basketball, and uh, and he has his crew. You guys want to play basketball? And they all oh, right, right, right. <laughs> That's a bit of a deeper cut. Sure, it's first. Uh, awesome. I I was surprised about two, two things on that. <laughs> Um, I, I was surprised one that we didn't see any White Walkers get killed until the, before the Night King. Like mm-hmm. you know, I know that we've had the, uh, I, I know we had seen a White Walker get killed, which then um, obliterated all the whites. Like maybe they felt like they didn't need to sell that again. But yeah, his crew was not involved at all. So they're like hiding behind the storm, and then just like with like their they, they were like their walk up gang. Right. And that's it. They didn't, exactly. they didn't kill anyone. Not any of them got taken out. I was also surprised. Die. Yeah. I was also surprised they didn't um, give us any uh, fallen character risen uh, face off with a living character. Right. Like they, yeah. they, they raised, they, they mm-hmm. gave the blue eyes to, to Liana Mormon and to Dollar Z and to, to a handful of others. But we didn't have the agonizing, like, I just fought next to you and I, you've been my brother or sister for eight years now i have to kill you again i was surprised they didn't give us any of that yeah i think that's a missed opportunity yeah well it was even the way i was you know i like many of us i was like oh why are they sending the women and children to the crypt because i thought that some dead characters in the crypt or in like the the grounds of winterfell yeah. would also be raised but uh but i guess i guess it was more like the zombies were only extras really like there weren't 
it was there was the one moment where you know uh liana's eyes turned blue and you saw her waking up but uh but that would have been i guess they only had so much time and it it was a they kind of kept it tight too there weren't a lot of uh digression and, and also like this is one of the shows that was starting to go long and it really moved i mean like I, that show this one probably could have gone another half hour and i don't think i would have um noticed frankly just because like it, yeah. uh, it it the the they were they were somewhat um disciplined i thought in terms of what they put on screen um which uh which i guess made sense i mean it's a battle everything's pretty intense i also was hoping um i was hoping more stuff would have happened in the crypt but nothing really happened down there yeah you know we had I, we thought about that before, and I think the challenge there is that you'd have been introducing characters that wouldn't have been on the show previously, right? Because Ned's body was never brought back. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the I don't think the bodies came back from their wed weddings, right? So we wouldn't have. It'd have been someone's like great great auntie. We'd have been like, yeah, I mean, we get it that you know this is a start, but do we really have any investment in this person coming back? So, and they would have been super skeletal understand. too, right? Like right. they would have been just a skeleton. You'd have been like, okay, now you've got like the the shape, you got like the hip bones of a Stark. I can tell. <laughs> I'm not sure which Stark you are because everybody's been decomposed for exactly. so long. Exactly. Other than maybe Rob, Rob is could Rob have was Rob all decomposed? I don't think Rob made it back though, right? Yeah, I guess he didn't. You're right. He didn't make it back in the Red Wedding. The, I'm thinking the only one who may have, and that's probably still unlikely, would have been. Uh, recon from the Battle of the Bastards. There were so many dead bodies at that point. Like, how are they able to have even sort him keep, out? Right? I'm gonna keep digging to find this little boy body. <laughs> That was the moment where I was kind of expecting the that Bran and the Night King to kind of high five each other and reveal that they were the same entity. Um, because you know, obviously, if you read the uh, the various hypotheses floating around, that was one of the main ones. And I mean, I thought that was plausible, honestly, because what 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 um other interest did the Night King really have with Bran? I, I think it's still unclear, like what the nature of their relationship is. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I was I was expecting some some kind of uh, more interesting or more intricate connection between the two of them to kind of be revealed. At that sure. moment. I had the same take just to just to plus one what Ken just said. Like I I really thought that the Brand Night King engagement was going to have been orchestrated by Brand. That you know, like his saying "Fion, you're a good man" felt like it was setting up. A, I've set this whole thing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I like I like the image of the high five between Brand and the Night King. Like, <laughs> I, I may not have expected specifically that, but like that effectively that, like I, I was definitely thinking some sort of communing, communing between the two of them. And uh, it was just regular old, you know, big baddie Bond villain, as we were saying before, like just takes too long to kill the three eyed Raven and then gets, gets got by a uh, jump in Jehoshaphat there. Like it does, it, it felt like there should have been something more intricate. And what was Bran even doing? He left and said, I'll be back. But he was just flying around. He didn't come back with any new information. He was just yeah. flying around for the sake of flying around. Like, dude, like, we need you now. Like, tell us, like, he's approaching from the east, like something. Sometimes you just got to work. I mean, they, the the coming attraction scenes make it look like uh, you know they the the plot progresses pretty fast, you know, and we're we're halfway through the final season, and you know we've addressed like half of the 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 sort of the, the major com the competing army, you know, so that's resolved. So um, I think is a little bit of uh, what I think Brandon was touching on is probably, and I think. Frank would have mentioned it too. It's probably a little body count kind of like, like what's the state of our army? So, so I would expect that they realize they're not in particularly good shape. The dragons hopefully are okay. You know, so I think that's, assuming they still have the dragons, uh, I think they feel pretty good. And it even, I think in the coming attractions, uh, it sounded like, you know, Danny was ready to kind of bring the pain, you know, so, so, uh, I, I am curious though, because that's now two episodes uh, since we've seen Cersei. Mm -hmm. So, like, 
what's going on all Cersei from here on out right I imagine she's going to be in every episode from here on out yeah exactly but but like what is you know she this was her sort of she was anticipating uh, a major conflict that she could then fight a depleted army Mm-hmm. Right. In, in the end game and that does seem like it has played forward for me just one of the note on on the the war here so i i thought going into this episode that there was no way they were going to kill the night king in episode three so that was two. Yep. but as i was watching and i realized they had a real problem if they didn't because let's say what i thought was going to happen coming in the end of the episode was you know like a band of i don't know uh fewer than 100 people maybe many, many fewer than 100, like all the majors were going to escape, maybe via dragon, maybe via something else. But if that happens, doesn't the, the Night King just raise all of the dead again? Right. Like mm-hmm. the problem is you kind of need, if you don't kill him in this episode, you need to have this episode again, the same episode, basically, right. with the twice as large army. And that, that kind of seems lousy. So as, as I saw him raise all those people, I was like, oh, no, he has to die. Because yeah. otherwise the showrunners, they've got, they've, got like a, they've got a problem on their hands that then now you really need some magic to resolve it. You know, like the mm-hmm. Golden Company isn't going to kill the night, the, the army of the dead, which is not twice as big. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's, um, so I, I, I guess we, they had to do what they had to do. And, and now we're turning to resolving with Cersei. I think that'll be interesting. All right. So the take I, I want to hear from each of you, Ken, let's start with you is now that this episode has happened and we've seen the Battle of Winterfell and we know that the Night King is no longer with us, who sits on the Iron Throne at the end of this series? Has something changed in your eyes uh, throughout this episode that now has pointed to someone else? Or are you sticking with whomever you thought at the beginning of the series would in fact sit on the Iron Throne at the end? I, I don't know if I really want to venture a guess. I, I think I think there are several legitimate claims to the throne at this point, and that's what's going to make the, the next few episodes um, all the more interesting. The weird uh, hookup between Arya and Gendry has me thinking, like, what's going to become of that? I mean, is that a legitimate claim to the throne? I, I think probably. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I, think, I think it's not going to be Jon Snow. Yeah, I've been on the, I think it's going to be Danny with John's child and John having died. I've been on that tip for a while. So I think I'm going to stick with that. Um, it should, I, I was, uh, I remember back to a previous episode of the Citadel. I think Mike was making the point that it really can't be Cersei. Like it, it's, it's going to have to be like a real tough sell to the audience for it to be Cersei. So if you say it's not Cersei, then it's going to be someone fine. I'm going to go with Danny uh, in on the Iron Throne with the baby uh, in my Game of uh, Game of Thrones clue. No clue, right? So I'm going to go with something <laughs> completely uh, random and say that it's they're going to give us someone that we are okay with but don't really want, like Sansa. Like she's going to be the one we're going to like. Ah, like I guess I'm okay with it. Like, um, and I also know that regardless of who gets the throne, there's a huge debt that still needs to be paid off to the Iron Bank that Cersei has now bestowed upon the kingdom. The, so no matter what, someone's coming in with some, uh, you know, red letter uh, mail coming in. So follow follow the money, I like that. There'll be like a, there'll be like a deficit problem, like regardless. Immediately. Yeah, yeah, people are in inherent uh, uh, recession, so to speak. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. Uh, Frank kind of stole my thunder, but I, I actually I wouldn't mind seeing Sansa uh, take the whole thing, and even uh, the Sansa Tyrion stuff. There's been yep. uh, interesting exchanges between Sansa and John, Sansa and Danny, and now Sansa and Tyrion. And um, not sure how it plays forward, but uh, um, I just when I think about what her character has gone through, and uh, and. Uh, I, I've really come around to her as a character over the years. Uh, so um, I, I thought that was an interesting, because like in some ways she's the truest Stark, you know, like she's the truest successor to uh, to her her father, I think, especially now that John isn't even, uh, you know, Ned's son. So, um, you know, if you did want to have that sort of tie back to uh, the first season, uh, I thought that might be an interesting pathway and then you know is Tyrion her hand or is you know what's actually going to happen between Tyrion and Sansa actually I, I'm 
I'm more interested in that than I expected. Um, I will say that I think uh, in the end, Jon Snow will get the, the Iron Throne, but will denounce the Iron Throne and let Danny take it. I, I think that there's there's some plot lines out there. You've, if you read about Jenny's song online, uh, some people point to that pointing to John and Danny's story. Um, I think John will you know, bend the knee one last time and let Danny take the Iron Throne, even though he is said to be the rightful heir. Dan Shriver, Mike Palmer, back here after the edited version of our live stream. You heard the highlights. If you want to watch the entirety, you can head on over to our YouTube channel. You search uh, Trending in Education. It's the, the live stream that is up there. We are now joined by Kristen Smith. Kristen, how are you doing? Yay, and thanks for having me. I, uh, I'm good. I like the episode. <laughs> so, so probably in the minority, but uh, from what I've heard, but, but I, I dug it. So, so excited to, to talk a little bit more about it. It was dark, but manageable. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I don't know if you want to start with this right off the bat, but I love that Arya killed the Night King like that. Oh my God. That's the best. And I'm continuously very angry every time I read something with someone saying, how did she get by them? I don't understand. Like, how did she do it? It's just driving me a little batty, but yeah. I, I think it. I think Mike, you said, or, or might have been Brandon, that of all the people who were most qualified to take down the Night King, uh, Arya's training and her, yeah. you know, the faceless man and all of right. these the training points, she she was the one, right? Totally. Yeah, it's obvious and it's obvious in retrospect, but like they set up the. It's almost like uh, when they when I saw the app the, the the breakdown, you know, behind the thrones or whatever it is on HBO right after when they yep. showed the. Um, the directors, the showrunners take. But uh, the idea that this setup really had been in place for years, um, I thought was really uh, interesting. And then even they, the fact that they put all 19 characters into play at the same time so that any of them could conceivably have killed the Night King. Uh, also, any of them could have died. And then I think what people are, you know, Chris, to just be clear, like, 74% on Rotten Tomatoes, okay? So like this, this is, the, this is the, the situation now, is like people are saying uh, relative to other Game of Thrones uh, reviews, critical reviews, this is the second lowest in, in all time, yep. uh, which is truly remarkable to me. That said, it's still 74% uh, certified fresh. So right. like uh, that means the majority of folks uh, 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 kind of not quite overwhelming. If it was like an election, an overwhelming majority, like if your favorability is 74%, you're, I, I don't, nobody, nobody, I mean, that's like top of the, top of the charts. The challenge is that all the other episodes, uh, aside from one that we don't really need to get into, but there was more like controversy around it. Uh, understandable controversy, but, but we're not going to, we're not going to dig into the all time lowest, but like the, the rest are all just consistently like record breakingly high reviews. Like right. every critic loves every show. And like, I think for this go around, you get more attention with the hot take. So you get more attention by going critical uh, cause it's sort of the culture of outrage, right? So like you need the, you need the take to get the counter takes and everybody needs to ratio you. And like, and like, that's just kind of the world we live in. So, uh, that said, I mean, there's, it's also, there's just so many takes now right, emerging, although I haven't heard, I haven't heard as much around what's actually going to happen in the next few episodes. Cause I feel like there's enough room to like execute some more complexity among the characters. I hope now that the supernatural army is out of the way. Cause like the supernatural army needed a supernatural resolution. Like you're not going to be like, Oh, you know, we performed a, a very clever flanking maneuver and therefore, you know, defeated all the whites and all the people who died before, you know, it's like, you're gonna have to beat them with some sort of special, special thing. Dan, I, I did, I do remember you have a take around um, uh, the Night King's uh, uh, armor choice, well, right? 
he's been alive for what a thousand years or so yeah. um yeah. and you'd think over time he'd learn that valerian steel could could take him out and may right. have better protective gear yeah. when rolling up on an army of people who want him dead I right, mean, right. dead dead i guess whatever right. phrase you need to use there so i i thought he was a little i think you said a little airy you know, a little yeah. loose there in the mid drift. Well, I mean, just I'll stand by my take that it was a trap game for the night, <laughs> right? I mean, this had trap game written all over it. Like he was looking past Bran, really looking past this whole situation. I got this, and uh, he got a little yeah. cocky. Uh, he wasn't uh, wasn't as careful as he would expect that supernatural villain uh, right. to be. But uh, but yeah, I did. I think he probably likes the exposed uh, mid drift, like the airy in the winter. He probably. You know, he wants to be cold. It's like right. he's the first of the rest of us. He's like, oh, it's it's subarctic out here. Let me uh, let me uh, you know gun show. You know, it's time to expose uh, expose the the forearms and and such. But uh, yeah. Well, well, I do think too. I I think that was intended to be shown too, even with Arya, because I know getting back to everyone saying like, how could he not see know what was going to happen mm -hmm. when Danny's dragon is breathing fire on him and he just like smiles back at her yeah i really think is showing that cockiness of like oh yeah your dragon you think your dragon's taking me out like i you guys are all done like i've got all of you cornered no one's coming at me like i just don't think he thought he'd need armor or anything like yeah that. And, uh, it is, and i, think I mean it, it and it is very much like you know uh you know remember the fearless girl statue uh in wall street got a lot of coverage like we've talked about like you know, uh, fierce femininity and the idea of like, you know, Me Too and women sort of like reclaiming, reasserting themselves like for, uh, you know, the, the Night King to be like impervious, like arrogant, masculine power. And then for that to be taken down by, uh, you know, the, the well-trained sort of quiet assassin, uh, you know, that it is an interesting uh, sort of like, I like to talk about the zeitgeist, but uh, there are a lot of like, uh, like archetypes being played with here that I think are, are hugely relevant to like sort of a broader, like national, really global conversation, totally. but specifically in the US right now, I think we're playing, playing through a lot of this. And like, in some ways, this show serves as theater for us to help process our own understanding of what's going on, you know, which is why I, I would agree 100%, uh, you know, Kristen, on the on the Aria take. I've seen the, and like, that. also that was made for Twitter. I mean, like, yeah. the, the meme, the meme, the meme industrial com complex is firing <laughs> off, like, record-breaking uh, meme game. Uh, just because, like, the one I really like is the, you know, Air Aria, you know, like the... Yes. The, the, the takeoff on the jump man, because this is like the jump girl, jump woman. <laughs> Yeah, but she's actually a woman, right? Too, because you can't even really call her a girl now, because like she's kind of, you know, the whole the whole thing that that went on there. That other episode. <laughs> uh, oh my god, what's she gonna be like next show, uh, Chris? Right. What do you think? How is she gonna? What if you were like if you were acting as Arya, like what's your motivation? Like where's your head at? And then what do you think it's gonna be like to? to watch Arya uh, in like episode four in particular, like right when she comes back. And then I, I don't know, any ideas around where she may go from here on the rest of the show? Well, I think I imagine her main focus, <laughs> I mean, part of me, like if it was me as Arya, I would just be like, you're welcome. Like to everybody, you know, like just come back in, like you're welcome. Walking into the room, like you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, like who's getting me a drink? Like, you know, like, like just sit down and be like, Danny, like, I want to ride a dragon. I think you owe me that now. You know, like that kind of thing. Contra it's like contract year. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, but I think truly, I, I am very curious for the immediate aftermath, but I think she's going to quickly after that, we'll just refocus on that list. Like, I, yeah. I think she's ready to take down Cersei. I think uh, my husband and I have been talking about, he thinks she's going to kill Jamie. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if, I don't think that's going to happen because I, think he i think personally he's probably going to be the one to kill cersei in the end yeah. but um but i don't know I, I i think she's definitely going back to the list and yeah well and then and then there is the whole uh you know sort of the both end around that i've also heard that Arya kills jamie and then kills cersei 
as the man with no face, you know? So, so like that I've heard that, uh, you know, again, like who knows, but like that one has some plausibility to it, yep. but I almost feel like they never, when stuff makes it to this level of theory, it's almost like they're doing this to distract us. Like there's something different going on. And uh, I do still feel somewhat, and maybe it's just that too, because I, I, I did talk to at least one person who said, well, this was obvious all, all along and I knew, and they stuck to that story. Because like, I didn't hear a lot of people say, coming into this show, as much as there's this huge industry around uh, prognosticating what's coming next, uh, I didn't hear a lot of people saying, well, obviously, I mean, come on, Arya's going to kill him. Right. You know, come on, you know, duh. Like, no one was that smug about it going in. So then the handful of people who afterwards are like, oh, yeah, no, no, I saw this coming all along. I was like, interesting. You were, uh, you were somewhat quiet uh, yeah. going in. You weren't really singing that from the mountaintops. So, uh, so right? it's, it's like, I want a picture with a yeah. newspaper from a date exactly. prior to Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> timestamps, you yeah. know, come on, come on. Kristen, do you have any different take now on who sits on the Iron Throne at the end? Uh, do you have a, a change of, of mind uh, coming into this epi episode to what we now have? Talking about Jamie, talking about Brienne, you have Gendry, uh, John and Danny's situation after he revealed his lineage. Um, all the different, any different take here on who you think uh, closes it out? So, so there's a part of me. <laughs> and so I know there was like this whole, whole thought too. I'm like, there weren't enough people who died in the, in the episode. And, and that, that thought, I, I kind of feel like uh, George R. R. Martin and, and the creators of the show have really shown prior to this episode that people like there's no one's safe. similar to real life, you know, like, there's there's no happy ending for anyone. Ned Stark knows that now. Yeah. Like every you know, and and so I kind of feel like the show is I don't know what this says about me personally. But I almost feel like the show is going to end with just somebody new, like totally. Oh sure. New. And just like yeah, it just never ends. Like it. Yes, they defeated you know <laughs> the, the Night King and and all of that. But in the end, you know, there's people are have power lust and and there's always somebody who wants to take over the throne and even all that work of working together as a team isn't enough to to kind of make things keep moving i sometimes i wonder if cersei will just continue in power yeah you know? and, and regardless regardless they're not going to talk about how hard it is to govern the seven kingdoms i mean like like just the administration <laughs> like like who do you want in your cabinet uh you know who do you want who's your secretary like choosing your secretary of defense not an easy decision, right? Like, I don't know. Like, you know, like, cause that's why like, they, they're not gonna, not gonna show that level of the show. Right. They're gonna just end it. Uh, and then that's like the, that's the, the cliffhanger. Like, how are they actually gonna govern is what everyone's gonna ask. Not convinced that the Cersei administration right. will actually deliver on all of her promises. I think that's really where we're gonna be left. I think uh, I want to know the transition team. Does Tyrion make it yes. from from hand to to be the hand? If Danny sits on the throne, do we get right. Uh, right. Uh, Jamie back as as one of the Knights Guard? Uh, so many questions. Uh, Kristen, any final takes here on this episode or on the the rest of the season as we close out this episode of the Citadel? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I, I'm excited to see how this plays out. I think uh, I will say I definitely don't think. The walkers are coming back. I feel like that's been a big, a big thought that I, I just don't see happening. I yeah. think they're done. Like I think I think it's to show like that the politics of the show is, you know, that's I mean, that's really the real evil right, of, the, of the show is like is is everybody's um less to take over and um and I just hope for some more Aria, you know, assassin. Well, maybe uh maybe like an Aria Aria. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's gonna do it for this episode <laughs> of the citadel and aria aria she uh hit the right notes uh this past yeah. sunday we will see what happens in future episodes only a few left we'll hear from Kristen again uh, on the citadel you'll hear from frank and ken obviously brandon and mike as well as we continue on some new voices as well will join us as we get everyone's takes 
heading towards the end of this epic television show. We'll see what happens in episode four and what has uh, in the final few episodes as we roll on. Thanks so much for listening. Find us on Twitter at Trending and Ed. Same over on Facebook. Citadels are available uh, wherever you download your podcasts. Also available over there on YouTube along with our live stream. Thanks so much for listening to The Citadel from Trending in Education.